Good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone. And welcome to the Ending Homelessness, a virtual conference. I am David Dirks, Director of Meetings and Events for the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And I am so grateful that you all are here with us today as we kick off our very first virtual event. How befitting is it that on this International Women's Day, I have the pleasure of introducing an amazing woman. She is a poet, skid row advocate, and a member of the Alliance's Consumer Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Suzette Shaw. Standing tall for dignity and equality. I'm not a liberated woman, as I am just a woman who yearns to live free. I wish to live free from the bondage of inequality because I'm just so longing for equality that is yet, yet to be. Yeah, we've come far, but how far we have yet, yet to come. Women, women are still striving for their equal sum. Whether we're sitting in the White House, Donald Trump Plaza, or up in Beverly Hills, to the lows of the Appalachians, the rundown sawmills, or the Catskills, whether your zip code is in Manhattan, New York, or right here in Skid Row. Human dignity should not come at the price for only those who could afford concierge prices and exquisite means. I humbly tell you, my voice, it is my power. It fuels me each day. In fact, it gives me the strength which surpasses none. Instead, it allows me to be more of my equal sum. But please know I am just one voice and I've won no battles. The battles they've yet to be won. This voice is just another gift God gave to me so I can stand tall for dignity and equality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzette. You are an inspiration to us all and a great partner in this fight and homelessness. All over this country, we have great partners. Many of you are in our chat box right now letting us know what states you are from. You all are continuing to work tirelessly to end homelessness, and I want to share some videos from a few folks at this moment. Hi, my name is Richard Bell. I live in South Minneapolis. I do this work because I have a compassion for helping people. Hi, this is Aaron Stover Wright with the Institute for Community Alliances. I work in the Des Moines office. The one thing that I wish people understood about the issue of homelessness is how far reaching it really is, how many aspects of our society are impacted by it, and how much it's a decision that we make every single day to keep having homeless people in America. I'm Mandy Seely, Sisters, Oregon, and I do this work because I've been houseless myself and like air to breathe and water to drink, housing is a basic human need. Everyone deserves a safe, warm place to call home. My name is Veronica Lewis from Los Angeles, California, and I do this work because I wholeheartedly believe in the power of redemption. Everyone deserves a place to live. Everyone deserves to be looked in the eye and acknowledged for just existing as a part of this world. Everybody deserves to go to sleep in a safe space at night. And everybody deserves to be loved and to be cared about. That's why I do this work. One thing that I wish people understood about this work is that the homeless response system can't do it alone. Addressing this crisis requires alignment across all systems, from healthcare to housing development to social supports. And when we do align and we have a common goal, we can move the needle. My name is War Miner. I'm here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Twin Cities. And I do this work because love is a verb and it takes the action of love to empower. technical difficulties. Wow. I am truly grateful to everyone across the country who is working tirelessly to end homelessness, especially during this pandemic. 
We also want to hear from you. So get in the chat box and let us know while you're doing this work. What do you hope people knew about this work and about people who are homeless? Uh, we want to hear from you and we want to share those stories. Now I want to segue into why we're here today during this plenary. Join me in welcoming the president and CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness, Ms. Nan Roman. Thank you so much for joining us at the Alliance's Ending Homelessness, a virtual conference. Of course, we wish we could have been together with all of you in Los Angeles as we had planned, but that was not to be, and we're still really grateful that we have ways to be together and to learn and to appreciate each other, even if it's virtually. I wanna start by recognizing the extraordinary nature of what you have all been through in the past year and the even more extraordinary response to it. We have had the pandemic, you had to reconfigure the entire shelter system, decompress, quarantine, isolate, revamp food services and provide hygiene. You had to move people off the streets and into hotels and motels and staff those. And you had to do it with uh, depleted staff, themselves struggling with health, family and income issues of their own. We've had the recession with so many people losing jobs, especially people of color, low income workers, women, and people in less advantaged neighborhoods. The loss of income and inability to pay rent have led to greater and greater housing instability and fears of increasing homelessness in the future. And we have had the social unrest and political division. And while some of this has led to increased understanding and action around racial justice, the political division became political violence that has rocked the nation and at a minimum caused additional stress and anxiety for so many of us. So it has been a lot this year, that's for sure, but you have managed all of this and we and the country owe you a great debt of gratitude for that. Now we have entered a new and we hope what will be a much better, but certainly will be a different period for our nation and for our work. We have vaccines to attack the pandemic and the COVID numbers are starting to go down, knock wood. The recession is technically over and the economy is starting to bounce back at least a bit. However, it is likely to be a much slower um, return to economic health for lower wage workers, many people of color and women. Some schools are reopening and most are planning to. And we have a new president and administration which seem determined to be much more directly focused on the underpinnings of racial and economic justice, including getting people back to health, back to housing and back to work. And there has been some reckoning and certainly increased awareness around racial justice issues. So while by no means are the problems solved, we have a long way to go, but at least some areas in some areas we have turned the corner and things are looking up a bit. I'd like to talk to you today about um, the challenges that lay ahead for us, what our opportunities are, and where we might focus in the period ahead. Basically, if our goal remains to end homelessness and make mo no mistake, homelessness can be ended, we will need to base our strategies on values that will both improve our effectiveness and give us a guide star as we move forward. Let re me remind you of a few um, things you may have heard before as they are based on uh, values that were in the framework for an equitable COVID-19 homelessness response. One is the commitment to address racial and income disparities. We must look at all our work, our strategies, in the light, not just of whether they might result in disparities, but also as to whether they help eliminate existing historical and systemic injustices. One way to do this is to involve people with lived experience, people with color and others affected in the planning and implementation of our work. We can also use data to uncover the specifics of where disparities exist and what drives them. Also important is our goal 
that uh, is that our goal must be housing, ending people's homelessness. Getting people into shelter is a step toward that goal, but it is not the goal. We have seen in this pandemic the impact of the social determinants, including housing, on people's health. We can build on this growing understanding of the intersectional impact of housing to gain more support for the housing resources we need. Another value is to make sure the most vulnerable people get help, including unsheltered people, people with disabilities, and families with very young children, among others. This can also help to address racial equity as people of color who have been discriminated against in housing and health are disproportionately in these vulnerable groups. Having said we should help people who are most vulnerable, however, we must also be clear that helping the most vulnerable cannot mean that um, others get nothing. We do need to use our resources more strategically to ensure that everyone who becomes homeless gets as much assistance as possible. And a final and very important value is to act with urgency. You did this at the onset of the pandemic, accomplishing things none of us would have thought were possible. It's hard to keep up a sense of urgency on a problem like homelessness that's been around for decades. And in the pandemic context, I know that you must be tired of, of everything seeming like it's urgent and being urgent, but homelessness is an urgent problem for every single person who experiences it. And we must act and respond accordingly. There are some values that can guide our work then, centering equity, housing as a goal, a focus on vulnerability, but something for everyone, and a sense of urgency. What are some immediate challenges that we face as we move forward? One is the move to stand down programs that may still be needed and that have worked well, but for which the funding is uncertain or unclear. Examples include the hotel and motel programs, and enhanced outreach to encampments. There are often ways to keep these needed programs up and running, but there may just not be the bandwidth to reconfigure the funding or staffing to support them. We are sometimes challenged to take on new programs that are funded by one-time only or time-limited resources. Even though the programs may be needed and may be well-funded, there can be reluctance to start something that, that can't be sustained over time. How do we take advantage of opportunities and figure out how to sustain needed programs rather than reject them because they come with some element of risk? Many jurisdictions are broke or fear that they will be broke and they're moving around resources to hoard local funds or because of changing priorities. This can make it awfully difficult to take a solid, well thought out and sustainable approach to homelessness programming moving forward. There are lots of challenges too, of course, around specific issues like vaccination. New activities and programs for which there are not the clearest protocols or obvious right answers, which are complex, and which may involve trade-offs. I will say, uh, just as an aside, on behalf of the National Alliance to End Homelessness, that we do think that homeless people should be prioritized for vaccination, a strategy that will not only protect this vulnerable group, but will also contribute to racial equity. And we need to be thinking about looming challenges, challenges ahead. What will happen when the eviction moratoria end? What will happen as unemployment continues for low wage workers, but income supplements disappear? How will we ensure that youth and young adults are able to attach to a diminished job market so that we don't have a whole new gen uh, generation of homelessness moving forward in the future? How we will address these problems and other problems in ways that remediate disparities and inequality among people of color and those living in dis disadvantaged communities are just a few of the challenges that we will face going forward. However, there are also some really incredible opportunities before us. If we can muster the will and creativity to take advantage of them, and it's a big if, we know that because there are so many barriers at the moment and people are just exhausted and depleted from the work of the last year. Still, I wonder if you have had the time to really add up the federal resources that are currently on the table to address homelessness. 
There are usual appropriations of nearly $7 billion per year. Then in addition, there was $4 billion in ESG in the CARES Act. And of this money, we estimate that something less than $2 billion has not been assigned to any specific project yet. So it is at the disposal of jurisdictions. In addition, um, the Rescue Act, with any luck, will provide $5 billion to help homeless people and those at risk. This will be routed through the HOME program and targeted to acquisition of properties, rental assistance, or for most of the uh, regular ESG activities. If you add together the CARES Act, the remaining CARES Act money, and the Rescue Act money, that means that we have nearly seven billion additional dollars at our disposal, again, in addition to the annual amount you already get from Washington. And that's not all that's on the table. HUD also has unused vouchers targeted to people experiencing homelessness and a significant number of 811 vouchers, rental vouchers for people with disabilities, both of which could be tapped, either as straightforward rental assistance or project-based to match up with acquisition of for example, hotels and motels. Hotels and motels, by the way, that can be purchased with the $5 billion in the Rescue Act. There are also single-use vouchers in the Rescue Bill that can go to people experiencing homelessness. And there is lots of other funding in the stimulus bills that could also be used to address homelessness, including TANF money and flexible state and local funding. So there is a lot of money on the table right now and it presents a one-time only opportunity to house a lot of homeless people and at the same time to increase the supply of affordable housing. I, I'm sure that you have all heard of Project Home Key in California. The governor used COVID relief and other funding to finance local purchases of hotels and motels for temporary and permanent housing for homeless people. In only six months, California added 6,000 units to its affordable housing stock targeted to people experiencing homelessness. Six months instead of the four to five years it typically takes for an affordable housing project to come online in California. 6,000 units, considerably more affordable units than California typically adds in a year and at a price that was more than $100,000 less per unit than usual. According to Mary Tingerthal, an affordable housing expert who's been looking into this for us, in a bold stroke, California showed that emergency funding could be used not only to pay to shelter people on an emergency basis, but also to acquire properties to have a lasting impact on the availability of affordable housing. And of course, hotels and motels aren't the only stock that could be available for these uses. We could create boarding houses, purchase single family homes to share, and of course, help with just plain rental assistance. What would be the impact of using this extraordinary level of resources to house people who are currently homeless? Just a back of the envelope calculation, if we used half of the money, not the vouchers, just half of the nearly $7 billion that's on the table, we could house almost 170,000 people for two years, long enough for most of them to get on their feet or to get another subsidy, 170,000 people. Would it be easy to house that many people? No, it really would not be easy. But I think if we have the support of the administration and it's an all hands on deck effort to be creative, if we don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, if we ask for what we need, and if we call upon the tremendous human resource that the homelessness sector has proven itself to be, we can take on this once in a lifetime opportunity to make a serious dent in homelessness. How could we not seize this opportunity? We have these and many other opportunities, but we must act if we're to take advantage of them. I know that you are tired, that you are worn out by the pandemic, the recession, the national division. I know that work is now difficult and complicated at the local level, and I know that everyone is struggling with a host of critical priorities, none of which can be ignored. I wish this incredible opportunity had come our way when we could have been more prepared 
or we, we'd have the leisure to do more planning and get ourselves together on it. But we simply cannot, we cannot fail to take advantage of the moment, of the resources before us, of the goodwill and partnership of the federal government and so many local allies as well. We can't miss this opportunity to make a significant reduction in the number of people who are currently homeless. We just cannot. In closing, I want to thank you so much for everything that you do and everything that you have done. I hope that you will take good care of yourselves. I hope that you will enjoy the conference and, and take the time to learn new things and get a breath of fresh air. I hope that you'll keep in touch with us and other national partners as we all work together to set our nation on a path to end widespread homelessness once and for all. Thank you so much for what you do and thank you for joining us here. Thank you so much, Nan, for your fearless leadership. Something that I wanna reiterate here is that we have an amazing opportunity to make drastic reductions in homelessness with the current spending bill that Nan just went through in her keynote remarks. So I just wanna encourage all of us to continue doing the work that we know is going to end homelessness for people and move them into housing. I also wanna take a time right now to just talk to those of you in the chat box. Um, unfortunately, the closed captioning may not have been working for some of you. If you refresh the page, come back in, press the play button, you should see the CC closed captioning logo in the bottom right corner. And now I wanna introduce a special group of, of folks. In 2017, 14 mayors and CEOs joined forces with the nonprofit leaders and policy experts, including the Alliance, to create a bipartisan coalition to tackle affordable housing and homelessness. Now, please enjoy remarks from members of this coalition. In the 21st century, we should not accept that homelessness in our communities is inevitable. The life-saving work of the National Alliance to End Homelessness is critically important, perhaps now more so than ever. Kaiser Permanente is proud to stand with all of you, and we offer heartfelt gratitude to you and your tireless service fighting for those who are the most vulnerable among us. People of color are disproportionately impacted by homelessness and housing insecurity. This problem has been laid bare and exacerbated by COVID-19. The health crisis and the economic fallout from the pandemic are hitting low income and communities of color hardest and threaten to widen the health equity gap in our country even further. We must take action. Housing and health go hand in hand. Every day, more than 12.3 million people trust Kaiser Permanente's top-notch physicians and nurses in matters of life and death. But even the best healthcare in the industry can't keep a person healthy if they don't have a roof over their head. Unfortunately, the availability of affordable housing has been on the decline since 2000. The COVID-19 pandemic has made the issue worse, leaving communities across America in crisis. The high cost of housing means a growing number of families are living in unsafe conditions. This means they're more likely to be exposed to environmental toxins like lead paint and poor indoor air quality from factors like mold and poor heating or cooling. These unsafe conditions are clearly linked to health disorders like asthma or nervous system damage. The financial stress associated with unsafe housing leaves adults particularly vulnerable to poor health. It causes health problems in youth, including increased risks of early drug use, depression, and teen pregnancy. The problem impacts America's biggest cities, and it's rapidly spreading to smaller cities too. It's also fueling rapid increases in homelessness. Of course, homelessness and health are interconnected too. Overall mortality rates among people experiencing chronic homelessness are three to four times that of the general population. Chronic homelessness can cut a full 27 years off of a person's life. Homelessness creates a real strain on our health system by increasing the level and the amount of care we need to give at Pfizer Permanente and limiting how successful that care can be. At Kaiser Permanente, we know that solving our nation's housing and homelessness crisis 
requires all hands on deck. Sustained impact at scale will require changes in policy, including federal investments in affordable housing. As cities grow, it's important that residents of all income levels have access to affordable housing that sets them up for good health. That's why Kaiser Permanente is proud to be a member of the mayors and CEOs for US housing investment. We found our partnership with mayors all across America to be invaluable and we're impressed by the momentum that's been created by harnessing the collective voices of mayors who are joining together to call for more and better investments in affordable housing and to end homelessness. We encourage you to talk to your mayor, ask them to join us. Together, we will solve America's housing crisis. Greetings from Bakersfield, California, the ninth largest city in the Golden State. We're located in the Central Valley in Kern County, where we have the privilege of feeding and fueling the world. Bakersfield Kern County recently was recognized by Community Solutions Built for Zero movement as the first county in California and one of five in the country to have achieved functional zero for ending chronic homelessness. That is for persons who have experienced homelessness for at least a year or repeatedly over the last three years while living with a disability. But much work still lies ahead. In California, homelessness looms as the paramount issue facing cities, as it does in many communities across America. California's homeless residents make up nearly a quarter of our nation's total homeless population. America needs to stop homelessness before it happens. As we continue to find solutions for persons already experiencing homelessness, we also need to invest in cost-effective strategies to prevent housing insecure families from becoming homeless in the first place. The pandemic has driven a surge of need for very low-income households that lack any cushion when facing a housing emergency. Our preemptive actions can help to forestall a new wave of homelessness by expanding successful efforts, such as the Emergency Rental Assistance Program with one-time short-term emergency housing assistance paired with supportive services and case management. These extraordinary times call for an equitable health and economic COVID-19 response based on data to prioritize the most highly impacted neighborhoods and the most vulnerable renters. I invite you to join with mayors and CEOs for U.S. Housing Investment, a bipartisan coalition in advocating for investment in prevention and stabilization up front to reduce demand for expensive services once a household falls into homelessness. Thank you, National Alliance to End Homelessness, for your purposeful leadership on these issues. May our strategic and intentional actions together demonstrate that we are our brother's keeper. Thank you, Mayor Go and Dr. Grossman, and all of the mayors and CEOs who have joined forces as part of the mayors and CEOs for U.S. housing investment. Well, folks, that concludes this plenary. We will see you in the breakouts, which begin at 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific. And remember, when you join a session, to press the player button. Also, join us for a virtual networking event this evening at 5.05 Eastern Time, 2.05 Pacific. It is, it is limited to the first 300 people. Tomorrow morning, also, join us for a meditation session at 11 o'clock Eastern Time, 8 o'clock Pacific. It's also limited to the first 300 people. Once again, thank you for 
attending this conference. Thank you for all the work that you are doing. And we actually gave you a couple of minutes to take a break before the planner, before the workshop sessions began. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference.